Father, before me, I'd like to say I appreciate again the opportunity to be a participant in this study. I appreciate your confidence in me to be able to address the topic, and I hope that I'll be able to do that and be able to do so to the satisfaction of all, as well as to uphold the truth of the Word of God. Tonight, as you can see from the slide up here, my topic title that was given to me is Textual Traditions and the Use of Modern Translations. And then the questions that accompany that are, uh, number one, what is the importance of textual uh, criticism for both scholars and Christians? Number two, how can a Christian teacher know which textual variants are appropriate for consideration in sermons? And then number three, how can we be sure that modern translations of the Bible aren't inappropriately translating and thereby misleading the reader? Now, I'd like to reword the title and put it into terms that address this as well as maybe simplify it a little. How to translate and what to translate. These are not the same questions. Um, how to translate is the idea that is addressed in question number three. How can we be sure that modern translations of the Bible aren't inappropriately translating? And then questions one and two deal with the question of what to translate. How to translate has to do whether or not we're correctly translating a Greek word or sentence or phrase. What to translate has to do what Greek sentence or word we're translating from. And I'll try to clarify that as we go along. Now, the next thing, well, I want to say that uh, I'm really not going to address the first question that we had up here, how to translate. If anyone has a question about that in the question and answer, I'll be glad to try to address it if I can. But I'm going to devote the most of my attention tonight about the question of what to translate. Now, if you're not sure what I mean by that, I'm talking about the difference in Greek texts and what that amounts to in the practical world in the translations that we see today, just to sort of give you something to hook to here in this. Uh, it concerns the question of sometimes what is called missing verses in the modern versions, and I'm going to address the question tonight as to the real reason why that is, instead of many of the things that are often said about it, the real reason for so-called missing verses, and then we'll, uh, that'll be the bulk of our lesson tonight. Now, also, I realize there may be terms in the questions that may not be familiar to people, so textual criticism is a term I'm going to define, as well as the term textual variance, and these two things of course are closely related. So the question is, what is textual criticism as expressed in question number one? I'll let Dr. Daniel Wallace, who is probably today's most well-known textual critic, answer it this way. Textual criticism is the study of the copies of any written document whose original is unknown or non-existent for the primary purpose of determining the exact wording of the original. Now that applies to a lot of different ancient documents and not just the Bible, but we're interested mainly in the Bible and in specifically the New Testament. Now it's like this. Let's let this image here of a Greek document represent the original that the Apostle Paul held in his hand, the piece of blank papyrus that he wrote upon and applied ink to and when finished sent it off to the church that he intended to send it to. We call this the original, or technical term the scholars use, is the autograph. Now from this autograph then, copies were made down through decades after the time of the writing of these, all the New Testament books. Various copies were made, sometimes it was the copies of the original in the beginning, later on it was copies of the copies. Now what happened with the passing of time is that the original disappeared. In fact, all 27 books of the New Testament, a lot of people don't know this, but the originals that the apostles actually held in their hand and wrote on do not exist for any of the 27 books of the New Testament, nor for that matter any of the literature that the brother before me mentioned. All that, list, all that remains are copies, but not only are there only copies remaining, but the truth of the matter is, is that not even all of the copies that have ever been made are still in existence. In fact, a good many of them have disappeared. So textual criticism is the discipline, the academic discipline of comparing what remains of existing copies in order to weed out 
copying errors in order to get back to the original that is now no longer existent. And that, I think, should itself speak to the significance of textual criticism. Now then, the other question in, or the other term in the second question that I put at the beginning is, what are textual variants? Well, you could define it this way. The differences between two or more handwritten copies of an ancient document that resulted from human error or human copying error. So we're back to these copies again. So if there is a difference in this copy that's maybe found maybe in the realm of Greece, and this copy over here of a copy of the New Testament that was maybe found in the area of Egypt, uh, where these two people who copied them did not have direct, direct contact with each other and may have actually lived in completely different centuries, if there's a difference from this one to that one, or say, let's say, there's a difference between this one and the other three, even if it's in one letter in the spelling of a word, that's scholars, technical, textual scholars count that as a variant. And so they have to compare these variants in order to arrive uh, at the wording of the original document, which is ultimately the, the goal of such enterprises. Now then, a little timeline here. You know, most of us, I think, are aware of the fact that our New Testament was written in Greek in the first century, 2,000 years ago. We're also aware of the fact that when we're reading the Bible today, since we're not Greek-speaking people, we read an English translation. Given the fact that we're reading an English translation, we're also aware of the fact that sometime in the past 400 years or so, depending on which version we're reading from, uh, the New Testament had to be translated into English sometime in the last 400 years, 400 years ago, or maybe 50 years ago, depending on our version of choice. Now, right here, in this time frame right here of about 16 plus centuries, there is a great gap in knowledge of what happened during that period of time. Now, some, a lot of preachers have looked into this, a lot of brothers have looked into this, but I think in general, as a brotherhood, I think we really have no earthly idea what occurred during that period of 16 centuries. And so what I want to do tonight is take a few minutes, actually the most of my time, and talk to you about how to fill in this gap that I believe if we understand the information and we have the knowledge, I think it will take a lot of the mystery and a lot of the uh, uh, concern out of the translation issue uh, that sometimes seems to trouble us. So tonight we're dealing with what to translate. So we're going to talk about a brief history of the Greek New Testament. All right, let's start with Paul's statement in Colossians 4 and verse 16. There the Apostle Paul said, and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Now, we don't have the letter from Laodicea, but they did. And what they did was, is these early churches exchanged letters. And I don't, think that they, I don't think that they just sent off the original to the other church and switched out. I think they made copies and sent the copies to the other churches and kept the originals at home. And then those originals and those copies over time were copied over and again. So they exchanged copies, then they copied them again, and then they recopied them again. And so as centuries go on, copies multiply. So now we're going to consider the time frame from the originals where we just started there with the idea expressed in Colossians chapter 4 and uh, that passage there. And we're going to begin from there, from the originals, from the apostles' hands, all the way up to the printing press. Now that's about 1,500 years. And really what this is is just theory or a basic, very basic sketch or model of what we know happened or at least something like this, very much like this happened because of the copies that remain, we know this is what it happened. So we're going to look at the making of handwritten copies from the 1st to the 15th centuries. Now let's just pick the book of Romans. And this little orange dot right here represents the one that Paul wrote, the one that was in his hand on his desk to which he himself applied ink, or the person who wrote for him applied ink. It was sent off to Rome, and after that, they copied it. And then that cop those copies were copied, and more copies were copied, and more copies were copied after that. And a lot of these copies would have been made from the original, but not all of them, and especially with the passing of time, not all of them. Now, not only are these copies made, but as the passing of time unfolds, many of the copies 
disappear. Most importantly, the original disappeared. As I said, the originals don't exist and they haven't almost since, since the beginning. Then not only did it disappear, but other copies as well disappeared so that the evidence that remains now to us in the 20th century is only the partial copies that, uh, of, of all those that originally existed. So the picture I've shown you here is basically uh, that this hand copying process and the subsequent loss of copies with the ravages of time was repeated for all 27 books for 14 long centuries. So let's turn our attention now to all 27 books. These 27 books, as I said, were copied into the second century and into the third century. Now, these dots don't represent the exact numbers of copies. It's just a model. Uh, these, co these dots could represent hundreds of copies for each dot. So just think of it that way. But somewhere back there, and most think in the first or even the second century, the originals of all 27 books disappeared. And so the autographs, as they are technically called, are lost. So all we have are the copies. And these copies continue to be multiplied down through the centuries of time throughout 15 or really, I guess, 14 centuries if you start counting with the second century. Now, that is the picture. If you had all the copies that were ever made, it might look something like this. But not only are the autographs lost, but as I pointed out earlier, not all the copies remain. And some of the copies that do remain are incomplete and fragmentary. In fact, the most famous P52 manuscript that is supposed to be the oldest of all of them contains only about five verses from the 18th chapter of the book of John. It's only about the size of a credit card, a little piece of papyrus about the size of your debit card. But all the way up to whole copies of the New Testament and all things in between. Now then, it is estimated that only about 10% of all the copies that ever existed still survive. And truthfully, the majority that do survive actually come from the late centuries, meaning they were copied in the late centuries. Now, that means that today we know of about something north of 5,600 manuscripts, complete or partial, and that number is a flexible number for a lot of reasons we won't go into, but it's very important not for, for apologists on the uh, validity of the New Testament not to be too dogmatic about that specific number. But anyway, about 5,600 complete or incomplete copies exist. Now, in the 15th century, when the printing press was invented, all of these copies were not known about. We have them today, and they're cataloged, but in the 15th hundreds or the 1400s, that was certainly not the case. But gradually, from uh, the early 1500s up to the present time, these, other, these copies, these 5600, have come to light so that we know of about that many, just a little more perhaps, today. Now then, I repeat, we're talking here about handwritten copies. They aren't done on the printing press. Now then, when you were to sit down, if you were, to sit down with a book of Matthew and copy it all out by hand, what are the odds that you're going to make a mistake? At one time, that's the only way you could have a Bible, was to copy it out by hand. So what this means is that all these copies that exist, actually no two of them are exactly alike. The idea that we all have exactly the same wording in our copies of the scriptures is only something that's been possible with the invention of the technology we call the printing press. But all of these copies are not the same. No two of them are exactly alike. That makes people uncomfortable. If you want to ask questions about variants and things like that later, I'll be glad to address that. But these variants that exist among all these copies that are not perfectly identical, they must be sifted through to weed out the mistakes. That is the very enterprise we defined at the beginning called textual criticism. So the question at the beginning is, how important is textual criticism to scholars? Well, obviously, when you think of it in terms of what we just described here, it clearly is an important thing. We want to know what the apostles wrote. We don't care what tradition tells us. We don't care what someone added later on. We don't care what someone took out later on. We want to know what the apostles wrote. That's what we're interested in. All right. Now, we come down to this man right here that you may remember studying about in grade school, or at least we did when I went to grade school. I don't know about these days. Who knows? 
but uh, printing press was invented in 1439. And uh, we're going to start from the printing press to the King James Bible. All right? So somewhere along the line, someone had to say, look, we need to put this thing in print and print it like a book like we know about today. And so they had to take handwritten copies and make uh, a, 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 type, uh, a, a type in order to, to print the New Testament in Greek. Well, in order to find the origins of this, we have to go to a place called Basel, Switzerland, and introduce ourselves to a man by the name of Desiderius Erasmus, who was the first Greek scholar in Western Europe. Now, they continued to speak Greek in Greece, but that was the East. In the Western part of Europe, there were no Greek scholars. Everyone read Latin. Everyone spoke Latin, or at least read the New Testament in Latin, if you read the New Testament at all. And so Erasmus says, I'm going to put that thing into print. That Greek New Testament needs to be put into print. So when he was 50 years old, in the year 1516, he was the first to print and publish, print and publish the Greek New Testament. Now what did he do? Well, he had at his disposal what we've basically put on the board earlier regarding the manuscripts. However, he did not have access to 5,600 manuscripts. In those days, in fact, in Western Europe, there were very few people who had any Greek manuscripts. And so he had to very carefully find and go about acquiring some, and he was able to come up with seven. Seven Greek manuscripts. And when he found those seven Greek manuscripts, he began to put them together and formulate a, a text for the printing press. Now, what's important is, and this is key, this is fundamental, this selection of these seven manuscripts was purely a coincidence. That is to say, in other words, he didn't sift through and throw a bunch of things out, but instead he took what was available to him, and interestingly, we know what he had. In fact, you can go to libraries of the world today and look at those manuscripts, and in some cases you can go on websites and look at images of those manuscripts, the very ones that Erasmus used, and see his own scribblings and handwritings on them as he prepared them for the printer. Now then, here's a list of them right here. Now, here's what's important, not to know all these, as much as it is to note the fact that here, this, got, this manuscript here had only the Gospels. This one had only Acts and the Epistles. This one had Paul's letters. This one had the entire New Testament except for Revelation. This one had only the manu was the only manuscript for the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation that uh, Erasmus used, what he did, he had one manuscript, and the last page of that manuscript was missing the last part of chapter 22. What do you do when that's what you got and you want to print the Greek New Testament? Well, he did what any person in his situation would do. He was a very good Greek scholar, so he found the Greek Bible or the Latin Bible that could be acquired anywhere, and he back translated it into Greek. Now that's an amazing thing if you think about it. And it's amazing how accurately he was able to do that. But you know what he did? When he did that, he actually introduced into the textual tradition 17 variants that never existed in any manuscript up to that period in time. And you know what? The, the Trinitarian Bible Society that continues to print his Greek text to this day still prints those variants in, that man, in, in their printing of the, track, of the text that he had. But anyway, so that is something about to say here, my point being that, as you can see, he had very little to go on here, frankly whenever he did what he did, but he did what he did because he knew that other people were in the process of preparing to print and he wanted to be the first one to come off the printing press with this, with this new product that he knew people were going to be interested in. But you know what he said about it later on? There's a picture of it right there from uh, the first chapter of John. And uh, on the left column is the Greek, on the right column is the Latin, his Latin translation which itself was a scandal that he would even do such a thing as that. But you know what he said about his text later? He said, this thing was thrown together rather than edited. <laughs> and, of course, it's just the pressures of time and the circumstances that he has to get ready in order to print this thing, and he did. Now then, let's go on. We've got to keep hurrying here. It's about the year 1500. So not too long after that, as I've already said, Erasmus, in 1516, came out with the first edition of his Greek text that we just described. Then, as the years went by, he came out with four, 
four more editions, and each time he did, he had another manuscript or two to bring to light. So what that means is, is each time he printed this Greek text, he introduced maybe a variant here or changed a variant there, various places throughout his printed Greek New Testament. Then he died in 1536. After him, along comes another man, Stephanus, and Stephanus uh, carried on the same work. And he brought in more manuscripts, a very few, frankly, but just a handful along the way. In 1546, he published edition. And then in these three years, he published three more editions before his death. And what's important here is to note this 1550 edition. He begins to not only print the Greek text, but out in the margin, he starts to cite variants from other manuscripts that he brings in to his study and analysis of this. And here's an image of it, the first chapter of Matthew right here uh, you've, you've, in, in Stephanus' text. And out here to the right, he's telling them, along, as you read through here, you can reference out here and it says, well, this manuscript this says this, and this manuscript says that. And sometimes these variants are very slight and not wholly really significant, but they do make some difference occasionally along the way. All right, so Stephanus did that. And then when he died, along came another man by the name of Theodore Beza. And Beza, he really went to work. Uh, he worked himself pretty hard. He came out with eight editions over the next few years. And notice that the last edition was in 1604. Well, that happens to be the same year that the King James translators began their work of translating. Now, have you ever thought about the day they got out of bed, the first day the translators and went down to the office to start translating, what did they do? Where did they get their Greek Bible? Where, did they, uh, where were they able to come up with the Greek language to translate into our English King James Bible? Well, they referred to Erasmus. They referred to Stephanus' 1550 edition. And they referred to uh, Beza's 1598 edition. All right, so here again is a page from Stephanus, the first page. Here is another page from Beza's. Uh, he has the Greek text here. Let me get it back here. Uh, he has the Greek text here, his own Latin translation here, and the old Latin Vulgate translation right there. Now, what you've got here now are two different texts that use different manuscripts, and these two do not agree with each other. Now, when the King James translators are translating from this, what do they do when they find out that this manuscript in a place says one thing and this one says in another? You know what they did? They picked one. That's right. They picked one. They had to choose one because you can't print them both, not in the, not in the text anyway. They picked one. Now, there are King James-only advocates today who will claim that their choice was inspired. My friends, they were not inspired. The King James translators were not inspired translators. So they made that choice based upon various criteria that we won't go into right now, but maybe we can highlight it later. So as we go along then, the King James translation was published in 1611, about six years later, and then from there we want to go from the King James Version to the modern translation. So we've kind of brought it up to that area now where we're kind of familiar with things, but there is still a, about 350 years of development that I think maybe we are not sure about what, quite what happened during that period of time. So here we are again, the King James translation. Now, a few years later, a couple of fellows, Bonadventure and Abraham Elzevir, an, an uncle and his nephew, were printers, and they were in the printing business. And you know, when you're in business, you go into business to make money, and that's what they wanted to do. They printed a lot of things, but they saw that this Greek Testament thing was selling pretty good, and so they decided to make some of their own editions. And so they issued three editions. Now here's the thing about the Elzevers that is important, is their 1633 edition. Now the Elzevers lived in Leyden, Holland. And in 1633, they issued from the printing press their second edition of the Greek text that was essentially a rehashing of Erasmus, Stephanus, and Basil. They rehashed it. Uh, and then, I don't know, there's a, there's, there's a better term for it than that, but they basically reprinted some version of one of those three before them. Okay? And in that text, on the uh, cover page, you open up the inside, and on the cover page you have this statement in Latin. Now, this statement 
may not mean much to us today, but in those days a lot of people read Latin, and it's simply recognized today as an advertising blurb. It's a way of saying, you have a great thing in your hand. Isn't that what all uh, pro uh, sellers of products want you to think when you get their product? No, that's what they wanted. They, to put it in English, they said, you hold in your hand the text received by all, in which we give nothing changed or corrupted. Now what's important here to note is these terms right here in the Latin, textum receptum. And this textum receptum translates into English as the text received. Now then, as a result of this, as a result of this terminology, uh, the textus receptus has become the name of the Greek text that, first of all, that the Elzevir brothers printed but with time, they began to refer to all of the older editions of Erasmus, Stephanus, and Beza. They began to refer to them as the Textus Receptus. It's kind of like the, the product Kleenex. You know, Kleenex is a product, a brand name, but now we call everything, whether it is a brand name Kleenex or not, we call it a Kleenex. Even though the company that made that little tissue that we're using might not appreciate the fact that you're using someone else's brand name to, to refer to their product. We all just call them all Kleenexes. Well, that's what they did here. They just referred to the, the texts of the men of the past as the received text or sometimes abbreviated the TR. Now, as we go through this, I'm just going to keep referring to the TR. So we'll shorten it to that so you'll know what we're talking about. So as, as I said about the term Kleenex, all of these and later editions came to be collectively called the Textus Receptus or Received Text or the TR as, uh, as it has come to be called. Okay, now let's go on. Now we're going to go from the Textus Receptus, or excuse me, we're going to make the point here that the Textus Receptus was considered by the Bible studying world, the scholarly world, and anyone who was interested in reading the New Testament in the original language, the Textus Receptus was considered to be the Greek New Testament for 365 years from 1516 to 1881. Now, again, we're talking about the text that basically started with seven late manuscripts down here in these later centuries, not back up here, but down here, and moreover, with the passing of time, look at that circle there, it kind of grows a little bit as they begin to pull other manuscripts into the consideration as they continued to publish more and more editions of the, uh, of the, of the text, Textus Receptus. But what happens at this point is what we sometimes hear called the period of manuscript discovery and more printed editions from the 17th to the 19th century. So here we go. We're going to start with the King James translators again right here in 1611. After them came the Elzevers that I mentioned who called it the Textus Receptus. And now what we're going to see is various individuals, and you don't have to try to remember all these. I just want to give you a general impression of the progression of events. Brian Walton issued a, a version of the Textus Receptus in the mid-1600s. He had about 30 manuscripts at his uh, disposal. Later on, John Fell in 1675 did the same thing. John Mill in 1707, 1707 did the same thing. And he had 82 manuscripts by his time. Now what he found was, and this is significant, is that John Mill was one of the earliest ones to really take seriously the collation of these variants among manuscripts because the more manuscripts you get, the more variants you're going to get. That's just the natural nature of the case. Now, here's the shocker. Here it comes. He found 30,000 variants in the manuscripts. Now this makes people very nervous. Now, let me say that the more I study this, the more I'm convinced that we have the New Testament in its original form today. I have no doubt about that. And as I've begun to study this issue, I may have been very uncomfortable at first, but the more I learn, the more convinced I am that we stand on very solid ground about the origins and the originals of the New Testament scriptures. Let me say a little about these variants. The vast majority of the variants are spelling errors. Let's use this word in English for an example. Have you seen it spelled this way? You've also seen it spelled this way. The difference is that in Britain they use the U, or at least in England, they use the U spelling. In America, we don't use a U. Now, there presents no trouble. But I can tell you that if that kind of difference in spelling occurs in one Greek manuscript, that's counted as a variant. 
And the fact is there are thousands upon thousands of this kind of variance in the scripture. It's also significant in the spelling of names as well. Think about that list of the genealogy in the beginning of Matthew chapter 1 and how easy it would be for people to spell those names differently, especially whenever the spelling of names and even the spelling of other words prior to the printing press's invention uh, was not standardized like it is today. Some people spell that name like that. Some people spell it that way. And if you want to go way back, even into Greek mythology, it's spelled like that. Now I can tell you right there is the right way, just in case you want to know. (laughs) Now... As you go on, we find then that the variants continue to pile up along with the discovery of manuscripts. Now, Edward Wells printed an edition in the early 1700s. Richard Bentley printed an edition. And Richard Bentley had some interesting things to say about these variants. He said, for example, he says, if there had been but one manuscript of the Greek New Testament, then we would have no variant readings at all. What a wonderful thing that would be. You think, if we only had one copy, not all those dots that I had on the screen, we only had one dot, and it might be from the year 1200, how would we know that that one manuscript contained the truth? How would we know that it was not variant and changed in some way? But whenever we have hundreds and even thousands of manuscripts, we can compare the differences and weed out the errors as a process of the t- process of textual criticism. He goes on to say, but if we had only one manuscript, would the text be in a better condition in that case than it is now that we have 30,000 variants? And his answer to that question is no, it's not, it wouldn't be better. It is good, therefore, to have more anchors, that is, more, one, more manuscripts than one, and another manuscript joined to the first one, and another one added, and another one added, only gives more authority as well as more security. All right. I think that is a pretty good statement about the variance, but we'll move on. All right, so after Bentley comes along this fellow here, Johann Albrecht Bengel, and we think of these scholars as crusty old gray-haired men, half bald, rotund, with a cigar in their mouth. But this fellow was in his 20s. And this young fellow was very concerned about those variants that John Mill uncovered. And a lot of other people were too. It was hugely controversial at the time. Now, he was so concerned because he was a man, a young man, who had a great conviction about the inspiration of the Bible. And so in order to alleviate his concerns, he addressed his whole life to the study of this issue. And you know, when he got done, he published this edition in 1734. And you know what? He came out with the same conclusions that Bentley did. He said, this is a good thing. This is a positive thing. Because we can look at all this array of evidence and come to the understanding of the original wording of the scripture simply by a process of elimination through the exercise of textual criticism. Well, we must move on. Johann Jakob Wettstein in 1752 actually had 125 manuscripts at his disposal. Moving on, Johann Jakob Griesbach in 1775, about the time of the uh, American Revolution, he began to notice that you could actually begin to group these manuscripts into Uh, sets or groups that had similar characteristic variants in this group and in that group and another group. And he was the first to issue the idea or to postulate the notion that there were text families or text types among these various groups, because that's only natural. People over in this geographical area copying and recopying the same copies are going to have the characteristics, they're going to pass those variants down. Same over here with this geographical area. And so it only stands to reason that there would be groupings in this respect. And so we have text families that later on by other scholars began to be identified with different geographical locations. Uh, The Western manuscripts or the Western tradition, the uh, Byzantine tradition, here in the west eastern part of the empire, and then down here in the south toward Egypt and Alexandria, Egypt, the Alexandrian body or group of manuscripts. Now, just for reference purposes, the Textus Receptus comes from within that Byzantine group right there. All right, next, we're going to look at the modern critical period from the 19th to the 21st centuries. This is a time where there is an explosion of, 
of manuscript discovery. The 19th century is such an amazing time, not just because of the marvelous providential story of the restoration of the church in that period of time, but the, the amazing advances that were made in that time. We think of it as a time that was kind of primitive compared to our own, but the reality is they were moving forward fast in all areas of life, and this one was part of it. An explosion of manuscript discovery. So in 1836, uh, a German scholar by the name of Schultz had 616 manuscripts at his disposal, and he was the first to begin cataloging them in a group so that people could uh, uh, easily access and know where these manuscripts are, what they're called, and other area, uh, details about them. Now, I'm skipping a ton of information from the 19th century, but we've got to get to the highlights here. There's this fellow right here, Lobigat Friedrich Konstantin von Tischendorf. If you are a young parent looking for a name for that baby boy, <laughs> here are some possibilities for you. You won't find them on Google, probably. But he was a fellow who was also convicted about the Word of God because he heard about all kinds of skepticism coming out of Germany in the 19th century in which those skeptics were trying to bash and literally shred the idea of the inspiration of the Scriptures. And we're still living with that today. We're still living with the consequences of those ideas in our modern world. But this young fellow right here, before he was the age of 30, was a world-renowned person because he went around the, the then known, uh, or at least in the old world, looking for old manuscripts. And he traveled in every kind of place you can possibly imagine. He was what we might say was, he was the 19th century Indiana Jones. Now you chuckle, but I've read that Mr. Tischendorf was actually the personality they had in mind whenever they devised the character Indiana Jones. So that's something to think about. But anyway, Mr. Tischendorf in 1859 discovered a manuscript. And the manuscript he discovered came to be called Codex Sinaiticus. Now that's a mouthful, I guess. But all it means is the Sinai book. And it was at that time the, the second oldest copy of the scriptures known of the New Testament. And, well, in the Old Testament, known uh, at least, well, yes, even the Old Testament, I guess in the translation. But anyway, uh, for the New Testament in particular, this, the, a very old manuscript. This one and another one were the, only, the two oldest ones known at that particular point in time. And this shook, rocked the world at that time. Tischendorf was a rock star in his day when he discovered this manuscript. So this was a game-changing event because this manuscript added to others that had already been discovered and cataloged uh, changed the perspective considerably. And that leads us up to the next event, and that is, I put it in red because it is a major transitional point. B.F. Westcott and F.J.A. Uh, F. Hort in 1881 published a Greek text. But here's what they did different. They did not republish the TR. They did not modify the TR. They didn't edit the TR with various changes like others who had printed it for 350 years before them had done. What they did is they said, we're going to scrap the TR and we're going to start from scratch. And we're going to use older manuscripts to uh, establish the text of the New Testament. And these individuals were hugely uh, popular with some and hugely contra controversial with others. Whenever they published this Greek text, there were those who absolutely opposed them. Now, one of the most famous is this man right here, John William Bergen, who was the Dean of Chichester in England. And uh, he actually believed that the TR was defective and needed improvement, that it actually did need to be improved. His problem was he just thought that Westcott and Hort got it completely wrong in the way they did it. But he wasn't against the idea. He just thought it needed to be done some other way. Well, much could be said about him, but we must move on. So here's our picture of the centuries. Here's where the Textus Receptus basically came from and grew somewhat with the discovery of other manuscripts that were just brought into the picture. But what Westcott and Hort said, we're going to do it different. We're going to build our text from here. 
We're going back to these earlier manuscripts back here. Actually, these weren't even known at the time. They didn't even have any discoveries of these up here at the time. We do now, but they didn't in 1881. But Westcott and Hort built the Greek text, or printed, I should say, or edited a Greek text that was rooted in these older manuscripts, which included the one that Tischendorf found in 1859 on Mount Sinai in, uh, down, down in the south. Okay? So from this text came the revised version published in 1881, because they were commissioned not only to, they were commissioned really to, uh, to uh, revise the King James Version. Even then, people thought that it was out of date and needed to be revised, and that's what they did. What they did, though, is they based the revision on the Westcott Hort text, and that made Dean Bergen very upset. But 20 years later, the American committee, who also was part of this translation, issued the American Standard Version of 1901. And what's important here is that a lot of Church of Christ preachers in the early 20th century who wrote commentaries used the American Standard Version of 1901 as the base text for those commentaries in the Churches of Christ. But you know what? That text that the, that the ASV that they used was based on is the same, well, basically the same text that the modern translations are based on, including the NASB, the ESV, the NIV, and others. And they, the Churches of Christ used that version a lot. They liked it a lot back in the early 20th century because it was so, such a literal translation. I see I'm going to have to hurry here. Okay, so after Westcott and Hort came F.H.A. Scrivener, who actually was kind of a, a partner with Bergen. He didn't like the Westcott-Hort work either. But by his time, he was able to catalog 3,000 manuscripts. See how the number has gone up throughout the 19th century. Then later on, I put it in green because this name is significant because it remains significant now to this day. This German fellow by the name of Eberhard Nestle took Westcott and Hort's text, took what Tischendorf had done with the Sinaiticus manuscript, and then one other scholar, and he combined the results and published what came to be called the Nestle text in 1898. Now then, that Nestle text has continued to be printed and printed again throughout the 20th century. Now then, one more here, or a couple more. C.R. Gregory in 1927 was able to catalog 4,000 manuscripts. Then in 1927, the same year, Urban Nestle took over from his father the mantle of the project that his father began and continued to publish the Nestle Greek text. Then something happened throughout the 20th century uh, about 140 papyrus manuscripts were discovered that Westcott and Hort didn't know anything about. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because manuscripts that were written on papyrus are very, very old. Second century old. Third century old. Westcott and Hort didn't know anything about them. They weren't, hadn't been discovered yet. But what they found is they began to examine these Papyri, they're found and they continue to find that the, the variants in those early papyri actually confirm Westcott and Hort's conclusions. And those are as significant to this day, of course they are. Now, moving on. In 1952, a man by the name of Kurt Alland joined with Nestle, and together, Nestle and Alland print what is called the Nestle Aland Noam Testamentum Graeke, which means the New Testament in Greek. And it's been published now through the 20th century in 28 editions. The 28th edition came out in 2012. It's oftentimes simply referred to as the N.A. N.A., Nestle Aland 28, or Nestle Aland 22, or S Nestle Aland 21, or whatever edition you happen to to have. I happen to have a 28th edition right here. You can buy it. It's on the internet. It's easy to find. You can go to the website and look at it. It's there for all the world and all the public to see. Now then, let's keep going. I'm about done. We're going to add the Nestle All on 28th edition right here. Now, I'm about to wrap it up. I know I'm running out of time. I'm watching the clock. So, one last twist in the road here. The United Bible Societies, 
the United Bible Society took up the Nestle Alon text. And the Nestle Alon text continues to be printed, and the United Bible Society prints exactly the same text. The Greek text is no different in either of these two. The only difference is in the footnotes and the formatting and the way they do the footnotes. But the United Bible Society, as I said, prints, and they, fortunately for us, gave it an English title, and they call it the Greek New Testament. Now, we've gone through all of this development in order to get to this point right here, and that is that all of the modern versions are based on the UBS text, the United Bible Society text. All of the modern translations, all of the modern English translations, all of the translations that are published in other languages that are made. I found that whenever I went to Africa, I found and ran into people who were using African translations, and I learned, hey, lo and behold, those translations are reflecting the same variants that I see in the modern translations in America in English. So it's happening all over the world. And the reason is, is because after Westcott and Hort published their text, the Greek world, or the, the scholarly world, and the students of the world who studied the Greek New Testament saw they did, what they did was a complete game changer and brought to light so much that uh, is so significant today. So here we are back here now. The received text is right here. This is the Ver this is the Greek text upon which the King James Version and the New King James Version are based. Up here is the NA, the Nestle Aland, or the UBS, United Bible Society Greek text, based on these earlier manuscripts. Now, as I said, all the modern versions are based on this, trans on this base text. Now, if you want to know the real reason why you open up a copy of the NIV, or you look up a copy or open up a copy of the NASB or the ESV or another modern version or even those that are out there almost in the realm of paraphrase or extremely loose translations the reason why you find that sometimes there are verses in the King James, New King James that are not in those versions or even in a few cases you'll find some in the new versions that are not in the King James let me tell you it is not a nefarious conspiracy. You know, I've heard brothers say things about people and speak in the most derogatory things, in the most derogatory way about something that I know they don't know what they're talking about. Now that can't be right for a Christian to con accuse people of things that that's not really the reason why it is the way it is. So if we're going to be critical of the new versions, then we need to get informed and base our criticism on information and facts and not emotional response. Now the same could be said on the other side of the equation about the, uh, the old version as well, but I'll get on with my point because I know I'm well out of time by now. But I want to point out as I close, and I'm about to close, that the King James Ver new King James Version puts all of this information right under our nose. And we might not even know it. I know some of you do. I can see you shaking your head, yes. But a lot of people use the New King James Version and are not aware that all of this information is right there under your nose. Look, in John chapter 6, let's look right here at verse 55. It says, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Look there. Number one, number two. That's calling our attention, those little notes right there, calling our attention here to the center column reference right here. You know what that is. You know what that's about in the Bible. When you look right there at verse 55, it says this. The NU says true food instead of food indeed. And the NU says true drink instead of drink indeed. Why? Or what is, rather, I guess the question is, what is the NU? Well, the N stands for Nestle Alon. And the U stands for the United Bible Society. It's a, it's, a, it's a piecemeal abbreviation. They take the abbreviation of one text and the abbreviation of the other, and they put them together. And they're saying that if you look at this Greek text, you're going to find that in these Greek manuscripts, it says true drink instead of drink indeed, true food instead of food indeed. Now, I want you to notice just how very subtle the difference really is there. This is a very subtle difference. One more real quick, John 6, 22. 
right there. It says, on the following day, when the people were standing on the other side of the sea, they saw that there was no other boat there except that one in which Jesus' disciples had entered. Look there. Footnotes. Look at the center column reference. Verse 22. It says, in you omits that, and in you omits which his disciples had entered. The result can be reflected in the ESV. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. The X is where these words were or are in other manuscripts, but not in the manuscripts that the ESV was made from. And so it simply says that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. This is just a couple of examples of the kinds of variants we're talking about here. And if you look in the King James, New King James Version in the center column reference, there are about a thousand such center column notes in the New King James Version. Listen, folks, living in the 21st century, we are a people who have more access to more information today, not just in the realm of technology, not just in the realm of all kinds of historical things, but more information at our disposal today to the English reader than any people of any generation before us. And of whom much is to whom much is given, of them much will be required. So I'm going to conclude here. Back here is where we started, how to translate and what to translate. Here were our questions. I didn't talk about, I didn't talk about how to translate. If you want to ask a question about that, I'll do the best I can to answer it. But otherwise, we'll just deal with these questions if you want to ask one or any other question. So I'll stop here.